and welcome to the history of Japanese board gaming. Um, this panel is going to cover mostly um, games throughout Japanese history, including some well-known imports. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with both Go and Shogi, um, which come from outside of Japan, but were modified within it. Um, and then at the end, I'll talk about some really neat modern board games coming out of Japan right now. Um, afterwards, this talk will be about 40, 45 minutes. If any of you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, if people are interested in giving Koi Koi a try, which is one of the games I'll be talking about, um, I'll have a deck and we can, and, and I can sit down with you guys and teach you um, outside uh, or in the board gaming area after this is over. Cool? Yes. All right. So let's get started. Um, we're going to be covering things in chronological order because a lot of the games that we're going to be talking about, especially in the, in, in the really older periods, um, were very much tied to the time period in which that, um, they, they were created or came about. Um, periods of um, economic upheaval in Japan saw obviously far less games or games that were much more portable. Um, periods of um, economic um, excess, uh, like the Heian period, um, saw games that were sort of more um, highbrow and um, long-standing. So I'm also going to be uh, prefacing each section with a little bit of history about the time period as well until we move into modern day. Um, before I move into any games at all, we're going to be covering a little bit of terminology. Some of you might already be familiar with some of these terms, but I'd rather get everybody on the same page because I'm going to be covering these things a lot. Um, first and foremost is an abstract game. Um, an abstract game is a game that lacks theme. So things like Go, Shogi, um, Gomoku, and Renju that we'll be talking about as well as chess. Um, so these are games that might have a bit of a theme, like chess, you're two generals typically trying to move your armies around. But as far as like, well, why does the knight move in an L shape? It's because the knight moves in an L shape. Um, that's, that's an abstract game. Pieces move the way they do because we say so. Um, a roll and move game is probably the one that you're most familiar with, uh, especially children, because these are games where um, you roll a dice and you move that many spaces and then you do whatever the card or the space or the dice itself tells you to. Um, it might not necessarily be dice. Um, it could also be, um, say, a spinner or something like that. So things like shoots and ladders and Monopoly and backgammon are all roll and move games. Um, you'll also notice that Sugoroku, uh, is it listed here twice? No, it's not. But there's two versions of Sugoroku we'll cover. They are completely different games from one another. They're kanji in, in Japanese. They're, the way that they're written in Japanese are completely different. But unfortunately, in English to us, they're both Sugoroku. And both of them, despite being wildly different games, are also two very different kinds of roll and move games. Trick-taking games. Most card games that you'll play, poker, those are trick-taking games. Um, they're also abstract in that we, they mean something because we say they do, but you're trying to match sets of things. That's a trick. So trick-taking games that we'll be covering are things like Koi Koi or any of the Karata games, um, as well as Richie Mahjong. Um, other games you might be familiar with are Euchre, Hearts, Poker. Those are all trick-taking. Last but not least are dexterity games. Um, these are things like Jenga, where your physical dexterity um, is what's uh, needed in order to play them. And the one game that we'll be covering from Japan that's a physical dexterity game um, is a really cool one called Menko, which I believe most of you have played even though you don't know you have. So we're going to be talking about um, early history first, pre-700 AD. So this was the start in Japan of direct influence from China. Uh, Chinese writing, Buddhism. Um, before this period, Japan did not have a writing system of its own. Um, all those Chinese characters were brought over, mostly through Buddhist texts. Um, and that was what was used to write in Japanese. Before then, it was just an oral language. And because of that, um, art flourished. And artists were even given tax breaks. So things like games actually got tax breaks. Um, what that meant was games started coming over from other, from other cultures into Japan. And the first of which that we'll be discussing, even though it's not the oldest game in Japan, is Go. 
Um, it's the oldest game. It's the oldest well-known game in Japan, and often considered the granddaddy of Japanese games, despite it being a Chinese game. Um, Go, Go is developed in China in the uh, in the Zhou Dynasty. Um, Zhou, sorry, um, in about a thousand BCE. Uh, it was brought. It was actually not brought to Japan through China, but rather through Korea. Um, Now, Go looks like an extremely complicated game, but what it is is an area or territorial control game. Your goal is to surround as much territory as possible. Although, like in chess, you can steal enemy pieces, and you can see some examples of that here, um, your goal is not necessarily to steal your opponent's pieces, even though that adds to your score. Uh, your goal is simply to surround as much territory as possible. And here's some examples of some very famous moves that are done. Now, the thing about Go, unlike, say, chess, is that Go typically does not end when the board is completely covered. Both players, especially in high-playing Go, will notice when basically somebody's won so much that it doesn't make sense to keep playing, the game is over at that point and the score is tallied. Go is also um, probably uh, very familiar to a lot of you who read anime or wa uh, read manga or watch anime. Hikaru no Go um, t taught many people, many young people in Japan, the rules of Go again because it was starting to become something of a lost art. Um, and Go is now back on the rise in Japan. The other game we're going to be talking about during this time period is one of the two Sugorokus. Now. Sugoroku is a variant of backgammon. Um, backgammon being um, a game most attributed to being coming from India, although there's no concrete evidence as such. Um, this game came directly through China. Um, and it was most notable for uh, often being used as a gambling game during this time period. Um, when, gam when gambling became cracked down upon, Sugoroku fell out of favor, um, and most variants of backgammon that are played now are the ones that came from India out um, westward into Europe, rather the ones that went from India out eastward into China and Japan. Uh, Sugoroku is um, not played anymore to the point where the true rules have since been lost, um, although we can backtrack and figure out more or less what they should have been. Uh, no, no documentation of what the true rules um, in their entirety, entirety actually remain. We're going to move forward into the Han period. Um, this is 800 to 1100. Um, this was an incredibly peaceful period. Um, it was so peaceful, in fact, that um, social rank during this time period was based on things like fashion. Um, the number of layers of kimono that people wore uh, and how they were wearing them actually determined their rank in court. Um, it was also a high period of Japanese art. Again, the country was so peaceful, people were bored, had nothing to do. So arts, literature flourished. Um, one of the oldest known works of literary merit um, was written by a woman named Murasaki Shikibu. Um, so not only was education more important, art more important, but literacy was more important to both men and women during this time period. And we actually get Japan's first native board game that has persisted to modern day. And this is called Gomoku. Um, go meaning five. Um, it's, it's played on a Go board with Go pieces, but it is not Go. Uh, in fact, the word Go in Japanese and the Go in Gomoku are not the same character either. Um, go here means five, as in five in a row. Um, it is a much more advanced form of tic-tac-toe that has persisted to this day. Um, and unlike tic-tac-toe, where there is a clear advantage in who goes first, um, Gomoku has this as well, but, um, and black plays first, and has an advantage. However, this was rectified with later versions of Gomoku, which we'll cover later, um, where despite black having that advantage for going first, they face penalties elsewhere that makes the game perfectly even and a true game of strategy. We're moving to the Kamakura period. Um, which was a time of great war in Japan. Um, 
it was a massive civil war, and Japan broke out into many smaller city-states, um, became a feudal, feudal nation, um, and in order to even travel within Japan, you needed a passport to travel from one section of Japan to another. This actually brings about the other form of Sugoroku, which uses an entirely different set of characters than the one we saw earlier. Um, this is a roll and move game in the way that shoots and ladders is a roll and move game, rather than how the earlier one that we discussed was closer to backgammon. So Sugoroku originally was designed to look like maps of Japan. So during this time period of strife, when people couldn't necessarily travel, um, they could still play a board game where you're traveling around Japan using dice. Um, and it became one of the earliest games to be printed and passed around very quickly and efficiently, thanks to Japanese printing tech. Um, it's pre-Gutenberg pre press because Japanese printing tech at the time was done via wood blocks. So someone would carve out a whole thing. They'd carve out the entire board on a single plate, roll ink on it, press your paper down, pull it away. Hey, you've got, you've got a board game that you could then, because it's on paper, a thick, sturdy paper, roll up and carry with you or sell to the few travelers on the road to pass around. Um, and this was a quick and easy way to move board games literally around the country um, through, through woodblock printing and, 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 and foot travel. Um, this has persisted to this day in most children's um, magazines. You'll find Sugoroku boards like this one. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is a one-piece one. Um, because again, since they're made on paper rather than on a board, uh, they can easily be printed and put inside of children's magazines. Um, so thanks to the um, sort of falling out of the backgammon style of Sugoroku, if you hear someone mention this in Japan today, unless they're talking historically speaking, without question, this is the version that they're referring to. So I'm going to take a, a break here before we move into um, sort of the, the Edo periods in later Japan <coughs> and talk about the Muromachi period, which is in roughly 1500s, and Karuta. Now this is my area of expertise. I love Karuta. I love collecting Karuta. I have many, many sets of different kinds at home. Um, and what's interesting about Karuta is the word itself, first off. It comes from the word car cards. Um, literally, from, from, from the Europeans who brought their own card games, at the time tarot, which is what um, modern playing cards eventually uh, turned into. Um, tarot was originally not for divinitation, that only comes in the 1800s. Uh, they were originally um, playing cards that became modernized and split into tarot that were used for divinitation, and then modern playing cards of our four, four suits, um, ace, ace to king that we know of today. So the sets that we'll see here that have survived to Japan look a little bit different than, and in some cases a lot bit different, than the um, European style of playing cards because they were based on much older styles than what we're used to here in the West. So the, there are two sort of main schools of karta that have survived to modern day. Um, the, f the first kind is called Portuguese carta, for that exact reason. Portuguese traders brought their taro over from Portugal. They were modified to fit Japanese tastes. So you'll notice that a lot of them look like they're four suits, and some of them are. But a lot of them are, are not. It's not that they're four suits of 10 or four suits of 12 in the case of Hanafuda, but they're actually 12 suits of four. Um, so Hanafuda in the bottom right is the most popular variant that has survived to modern day. Um, each, each one is a season, and then there's four cards per season. So it's a 48 card deck, um, and you, rather than reading it horizontally, you're actually looking at it vertically. And each one of those going downwards is one season from January to December. Th um, just like with American uh, playing cards, Karta themselves are not a game. There are many, many kinds of games, both gambling and non, one player, two player, four player, that can be played with karta. 
Um, Koi Koi is my personal favorite, and that's played with the Hanafuda style deck. Um, although there's many other kinds of games that can be played with Karta in the same way that you can both play blackjack or poker or BS with a, um, a pair, a deck of American style cards. What's interesting thing about Karta though, is not just how many cards are in the deck, but also their size. Karta are not this tall, they're this tall. And they're also not thin paper. They're either plastic or wood chips. So they're much thicker than what you're used to and they make a sort of thwack when you put them down on the table. Um, so if you've seen any anime or manga where karata are used, you'll often hear a very audible click when these games are played. So I just covered Hanafuda and Koi Koi. Koi Koi is a very popular trick-taking game. Um, it's one of my favorites. Players take in turns to grab a card out of a stack. Um, they're trying to make sets. What's interesting about Koi Koi is once someone successfully made a set, they don't have to call it if they don't want to. They can continue to play, but if their opponent makes a set of any kind before they can make a second one and then you know stack their points, their opponent steals all of their points. So it's a, ga it's a risk taking game. Once you've made your first set, do you want to stop it there and get the few points that you have? Or do you want to take a risk and say, hey, I'm one card away from making a second set. Let's hope that my opponent doesn't make a set before I do or else they're gonna take all my points. Scoring is a little bit tricky, so it's always good to have a sheet in front of you um, because sets are not equal. It's, um, it's sort of like poker in how you can have a pair or you could have a full house where it needs five cards to make a set. Some sets need only one, uh, two or three cards to make a set, while other sets need up to 13 cards in order for it to be counted. The other kind of karata that has survived to this day is called e awase karata. Um, e meaning picture. Um, the ones on the left hand side, uta karata, um, uta means song, but it can also mean poem. Um, this is a poetry um, karata game that is played traditionally on New Year's. On half the cards are the um, opening lines of famous poems, and on the other half of the cards are the closing lines of said poems. Um, so someone will start to read out the opening line, and all of the other cards are spread out sort of like, um, not go fish, but the, 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 um, the memory matching games, face up, and you've got your hands over them, all waiting. And then you have to know exactly what poem that is to be able to snatch it up. So it's actually a dexterity game more so than anything else. Um, these games become incredibly heated on New Year's. Uh, someone's hand will get bitten by the end of the night. Um, there are tournaments that are held all across Japan um, and they can get surprisingly violent. <laughs> um, there's actually a famous um, e -awase, e Uta Garuta um, anime that's running right now, which name, whose name I can't remember. Um, hmm? Yes, can you say that out loud for everybody? Yeah, so um, I've heard really good things about it, but I haven't had the chance to watch it yet. It's excellent? It just started its third season. Oh, wow, so um, getting a third season nowadays in anime is really rare, so that's, that, that says something, so. Um, if, you're more if you're interested in checking out uh, Uta Ga um, Garuta, that might be a good place to start. Now, Iroha, um, the one on the right, um, you know how in English we have um, the, what is it, quick black fox? Yes, so there, there's a phrase in English um, that uses every single letter of the English alphabet. Iroha is a famous Japanese poem that does the same thing. Um, so Japanese is a syllabary language. So i, do, and ha are all a character each in Japanese. And this poem uses every single one of these characters. So of course, in the top corner of these cards, you have one letter of that poem. We've got um, in the second row there, the first row you can fully see, na, di, no, and I believe that's ta at the very end and then he, te, wa, and ma underneath. Um, so again, this is a, um, a game where someone will shout out a word or a phrase and everybody's going to be scrambling to, to grab these cards. 
Um, although it's a game that teaches basically um, the equivalent of teaching the ABCs in Japanese, it's also super use, uh, super fun game to play even as an adult. Um, I always like to put an obake karuta. Um, obake karuta was a regional variant of karuta uh, from, from a section of Tokyo. Um, you don't see these much anymore. Uh, you can still find historical sets in some locations if you know to look. Um, but what's interesting about them and you might see it in some of these, is uh, the creator of Pokemon um, was inspired by um, Obake Karuta, as well as um, insect fighting in his area, uh, catching and breeding insects in order to create Pokemon. Um, so it's really cool that um, Nintendo, which was originally a card manufacturer, has sort of come full circle, and these Obake Karuta being, being sort of a, one of many inspirations for Pokemon, um, again, like the, the poetry karuta, there would be a poem or short story associated with each one of these and you'd have to be matching it at speed. So we're going to move into the Edo period, um, which is finally when the civil war in Japan ends, um, massive economic growth, but also isolationism. Um, after the civil war, basically Japan shut out, um, shut out all foreigners except for the Portuguese and a few other very specific sailing ships. And they were only allowed to enter through certain ports of call. Um, so native Japanese popular culture is now able to develop, one, um, mostly but not completely free of outside influence, and two, because nobody's fighting anymore, um, they don't really have to worry so much about you know swords and plowshares. You've got time to build games again. And this is when we get shogi. Um, and this is the earliest example of a chess style game. Um, so warring general style game, you, you'll see most, at least one kind of these in every major culture with returnable pieces. So in chess, you can actually get your queen back. In shogi, um, you can get most pieces back or they upgrade as they move across the board variants of chess. Here's what shogi pieces look like. Now like chess, each of them has a unique move set um, and a lot of the um, pieces move very similarly to their chess counterparts. The king can move one space in any direction. Um, there's there's uh, um, elephants and pawns and all of them move in very specific ways that you can see here. Uh, the thing to note is that when pieces upgrade, and all pieces upgrade, unlike in chess where you just, if you get a pawn to the other side, you can choose what piece you want, aka you want a queen, um, unless you want a knight. Um, in shogi, each piece will only evolve into one other version of that piece. So the piece is literally flipped over, there's another character on the other side of the piece, that's what it becomes. And here's Menko. You definitely have played Menko at some point, either with your kids or, like me, you grew up in the 90s. Menko are what Pogs became. Um, like Pogs, and uh, I'll, I'll explain the funny story about them when I'm done with Menko, um, it's a, the goal is to flip over your opponent's card. And when I say card, I mean very thick. Usually wood, sometimes thick cardboard. Um, but unlike Pogs, they could have been in any shape. In fact, um, do I have example? Yeah, the second, the second one on the top row is a Pinocchio one. Um, in the early, um, early 1900s, all the way through, uh, through the 1950s, um, Disney actually put out series of Menkel. Um, and you could even get holographic ones. These are not Pokemon cards, these are Pokemon Menkel. So what about Pogs then? So, um, Basically, Japanese people living in Hawaii in post-World War II um, were playing Menkel and discovered quickly that pog juice, pineapple orange guava, I believe, um, the caps on their bottles were the exact right thickness because they were the, the flip cap, not the, not the milk bottle cap that we're used to, um, to play Menkel with. So they started playing Menkel with pog juice caps some, um, the Pog Juice Company noticed that people were just buying the juice for the caps um, and playing it and decided to start selling them 
um, I don't remember if it was an individual or if it was a group, um, who brought them over to the States, not just as pog caps, but you know, as holographic ones or ones with cool symbols on them. And that's how the pog craze started. Um, Menko is still played pretty heavily in Hawaii, if you know where to go. And it's definitely still played in Japan, um, in Hong Kong. My, one of my Taiwanese friends says that they, uh, that, uh, they also grew up with, with Menko and still play it. Um, so especially in parts of Asia, you'll still find um, modern Menko like this. These are much thicker than, than standard you know, Pokemon playing cards. They're not designed to be played, they're designed to be flicked. Moving forward to the Meiji period, this is when Japan um, finally reopens to the West. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Perry's Black Ships. Um, an American general, named, uh, naval general, admiral, named Perry, brought over um, ships to Japan and basically said, uh, open up your borders or else. Um, they didn't get to the or else, but they did get to the open up your borders um, and trade between uh, Euro uh, Europe, America, and Japan um, either resumed um, or started. And this brought, brings about the modernization of some of Japan's older games, um, particularly Gomoku. So Gomoku, as we mentioned, Japan's first native board game that's still being played today, becomes the Nenju. Um, and Nenju is the fair version of Gomoku. Still overall same rules, still same board. You're still using a Go board with Go pieces. Um, but it provides white, who goes second, um, the opportunity to catch up. Black must win in a certain number of very speci specific ways, um, and thus this evens the playing field greatly. So if you're playing first and you're playing black, your strategy is going to be considerably different than if you're playing as white. 20 countries are part of the Renju International Foundation. Um, interestingly, uh, America is one of them. They have never won. Um, uh, last year's winner was Denmark. We're going to be moving a little bit forward in time now to Taisho. Um, this is the um, pre-World War II period. Um, it was a period of quite a bit of prosperity. The Roaring Twenties existed in Japan just as it did here. Um, as you can see, uh, here's a very, very famous uh, woodblock print of a Japanese flapper. Um, but as the 20s move on, just like America, um, in, uh, Japan was starting to be saddled with crushing debt. And we bring back some gambling games. And we've got, finally, uh, Ricci Mahjong. Now, Mahjong is also another game that comes from China, but Ricci is a variant wholly unique to Japan. Um, and it's a variant where you can, if you so choose, call your attacks. When you're down to your last piece, and you're one piece away from making a full, um, full valid uh, scoring row, you can, you can yell Ricci on your turn, grab the stick that you see here, put it in front of you, and that will give you bonus points if you're able to actually finish your set before anybody else finishes theirs. So it's a risk. You're letting everybody else know you're about to win. Um, and so people will know that, oh, hey, there's one piece less. They, they won't know what it is that you need, um, but they'll be on edge. If anybody's able to make um, a set before you can, um, they'll, they'll not only get points for that, but they'll also basically steal your stick from you. They've earned points for, for, for calling you out. So we're going to be moving into a couple of modern games. Um, some of you might be familiar with these. Some of you might be familiar with some of these. Um, but these are some personal favorites of mine that are coming out of Japan um, in the modern day. And almost everyone in here is probably familiar with this one. This is Love Letter. Um, and despite it looking not like a Japanese game, it is Japanese in origin. Um, and you'll see this with a bunch of the games that I'm going to be covering in this modern period. Is just because something has samurai in it, or um, feudal lords, or has anime style art, does not necessarily mean it comes from Japan. Um, uh, one that somebody, people constantly ask me, Takenoko, uh, which is about a, um, a Japanese gardener who's received some pandas from China and has to fence them in and you know, feed the pandas. That is not actually a game from Japan. I believe it's from Germany. Um, but either way, it's not a Japanese game, despite having a Japanese aesthetic. 
um, a very, very gorgeous pastoral uh, setting, um, relatively historically accurate, um, giving gifts of animals to, to um, zoos or the emperor between Japan and China was a very common thing during that time period. Um, that's how Japan was introduced to giraffes. <laughs> Um, and why the Japanese word is kirin, um, after the, the mythical creature, because that was what was thought of at the time. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean the game is Japanese. Likewise, just because uh, games like these, Love Letter, have um, non-standard art, at least for what we think of as modern Japanese art, um, because there's plenty of styles in Japan. Um, so Love Letter is a hidden roles game. It takes about 15 minutes to play. Um, it's very quick and easy to learn. In fact, the rules are right there on your cards. Um, it's not, even though it has a theme, it's really about being the last one standing. Um, although the, the theme is that you're trying to get a letter to the princess, um, and whoever is of highest rank at the end holding the letter, aka the one last standing, is the one who has successfully delivered the letter to the princess. Interestingly enough, the highest number in the game is the princess herself. So you can deliver a letter to yourself. The theme falls flat a little bit, but the, um, the bluffing and the uh, variety of the roles are really cool, and it's a great quick little game. And because it's only 11 cards, um, print and play is certainly available, or just carrying around the official deck is very quick and easy to carry in your pocket to play anywhere, like conventions are being stuck in a line. Welcome to the Dungeon is another um, modern Japanese game that I like. Again, it's a small pocket game that you can carry with you. Um, the art is gorgeous. Um, it's basically a game of chicken. Um, everybody is going into the dungeon, but nobody wants to go into the dungeon because whoever is left standing after a round of chicken, like, do you want to go in? Do you want to go in? Do you want to go in? And you're slowly losing your equipment as people are taking it from you or you have to pull it off of yourself to stay in the round. So the last person standing probably has the least equipment and the most monsters to deal with. You have to survive two rounds. Um, it, is a, it is a player elimination game, but it is absolutely hilarious when you have your mage, who is finally stripped down to nothing but their underwear, facing down five demi-demons. Demi <laughs> Deep Sea Adventure is another one, and Oink Games in general. So Oink Games is a Japanese game company um, that sell games that fit into a box that is the size of a playing card box, but are not playing card games. So as you can see here, Deep Sea Adventure is a full board game, um, but the box is literally the size of a standard deck of playing cards. So again, it's a nice small game that you can carry with you um, and pull out, and people will hate you. So it is a game where you're all trying to race um, to get the most treasure uh, under the sea, except that um, you're all sharing one oxygen tank. <laughs> And the deeper you go, the quicker your oxygen runs out. Um, so it is, it is pushing your luck, not only with yourself, but as a team as a whole. Um, and every piece you take means that you weigh more. So you can't swim up as fast either. So it's a game in wonderful hubris, as everybody's racing to get as much stuff, um, while they're also racing to not die. Other Oink games that are really fun, um, Startups is a great game where you're all investing in, other, in everybody else's companies um, by, by playing matching sets of cards, except that everybody's hiding what they're truly investing in in their hands, and you could at the very last minute um, pull out a takeover right in the very last round and screw over your friends, and the looks on their faces are priceless. Now we're moving into some s full board games. Um, and one of my favorite big box games from Japan um, in the last 10 years or so is a game called Trains. Trains looks like the most boring game on earth. Um, pulling it out to my friends for the first time is always one of the biggest hassles until they actually sit down and play it and realize they enjoy it. So Trains is a deck builder. Is anyone, feel, is anyone here not familiar with deck builders? Uh, if you played Dominion, if you played Clank, um, you've played a deck builder of some kind. What's unique about trains is that despite it being a deck builder, um, and you can earn some points in your deck, about 90% of the points you score are on the board itself. And the way you build your deck is how you control the board. It is, at its core, an area control game. 
um, you're trying to build um, a private railway across Japan, either across Tokyo or across Osaka. Um, and everywhere you build your stations, build up your, your railway, um, you're scoring points on the board. The way that you can do so is by having cards in your deck. If you've got a card in your hand this turn that says you can lay rails, well then you can lay some rails down. If you don't have a card like that in your hand, and you start with some in the beginning of your deck, but you gotta buy more if you need, if you need to come up more often, well, you're not laying rails until you find it again. So the money goes into buying more cards, but those cards directly affect the board. So the, um, the con areas you're controlling are being controlled by the decks that you're building. And it's a really neat hybrid, and despite it looking like um, a spreadsheet burped up onto a piece of cardboard, I promise you it's a really fun game. Another larger box game, um, especially now that it has some uh, expansions and also even a legacy variant, is Machi Koro. Um, Machi Koro is a gambling game where you can um, set your own luck, essentially. Um, you're playing craps, but every turn that you've earned money, you can buy another building that gives you, that gives you money when that, when that score is rolled. Um, and some, some uh, numbers that you roll um, give you money. Some numbers that you roll give anybody who has that item money. Some numbers that you roll let you steal money from other players. Restaurants, cafes, any of the red cards, um, if you roll that number and you have that card, you're not just getting, you're, you're getting money from other people, not just from your, n not from the bank. Um, then there are some purple cards where you can buy only one of them per game that give you some sort of game-breaking bonus if that number is rolled. So it's a choose-your-own-luck game where you are literally choosing your own luck as you build out your little tableau. So last but not least, where are you paying attention? Now you'll notice I have two sets here. I have my nice expensive set from, from Nintendo, but I also have the modern set that they've built. And I'm going to bring two people up here who would like to attempt to win one. If you guys were paying attention and would like to win a Koi Koi set. I saw your hand up in the front. Uh, is someone out in the back? Because remember, I can't see beyond one row. All right, you're eager. Come on up. All right, what are your names? Kamal and Deering. Deering. Welcome. Face, face them. All right. So, for one koi koi set from Japan, Hanafuda, we've got five questions. Whoever can get at least three of them right wins the set. So, um, I'm going to say the whole question out loud, and only when I finish can you raise your hand. Cool. If you don't get it right, the other person can steal. So. What is the most common game played with Hanafuda? Yep, one point. Renju is a modern day competitive version of what classic Japanese game? Yep. What's a trick taking game? Game where you're trying to take sets. Yep. All right, for the possible win, what is the original size board for Go? It was on the slides, but I did not say it. Incorrect. No. All right. Nobody got this one. But last but not least, on what Japanese holiday are, uh, are e uh, Awase Karta games typically played? Yes. Good job. Now, I broke the seal to make sure everything's in there, but everything is, and there's also rules. All right. So if anybody wants to give Koi Koi a try, or if anybody has questions for me, um, feel free to come up and ask them. All right, hi, what's up? They're going to hate me for this. <laughs> I didn't say I wasn't going to do it. Let me get this set open. <laughs> this is also a linoleum table, so I don't know how much of a snap they're going to make. All right, let's see how dramatic I can make this. Can you hear that from the back? Yeah, yeah they're, they're pretty loud. It's not like playing regular playing cards. And if you ima can you imagine an entire, um, like say, tavern hall of people playing koi koi together? <laughs> Mahjong's pretty loud too.
because those are, those are usually ceramic tiles. And these are the plastic ones. The, woods, the wood ones are even clackier. Uh, if there's any other questions. Hey, what's up? In the dealer's room? Um, I don't know. There's a couple of board game sellers. Um, if you are looking for a particular Hanafuda set, um, I can point you in the right direction. There's plenty of places you can grab them online. Um, the Nintendo store in the US actually sells Hanafuda because again, they were originally a playing card maker. They still actually make not just Nintendo branded sets as in like with Nintendo characters. You can also just get Hanafuda sets from Nintendo that are not, um, that don't have Nintendo characters on them. Yeah, no problem. They also, um, the, the, one in, um, the one in New York City, um, they don't always have them in stock, but they also do have gorgeous Go and Mahjong sets that are not, yeah, um, they, they don't have Nintendo characters on them. They're just like, Nintendo still makes these items and they're gorgeous. Anything else? Yeah, what's up? I'm, I would look at, I'm, I can look that up for you. It might be Gomoku rebranded re in the US. It wouldn't surprise me. But I've, I'm not familiar with it, unfortunately, no. Anybody else? For anybody who walked in late, I'm legally blind. You've got to speak up. I can't see you. Hi, what's up? Yeah, if any of you want the slides, um, just grab one of my cards and message me and I'll happily send you the slide deck. But if you're looking to buy any of these, any of the ones that I showed you in the back half of modern games, those are all easily purchasable um, either on Amazon or um, um, Wink, Wink Games actually has a partnership with Target. So there's a section in Target specifically for their stuff. Um, so either Amazon, Target, or your local board game shop. Um, I picked up trains on a whim. I didn't know it was Japanese at the time. Um, and then I brought it with me. I went to college in Japan and they're like, uh, we know this game. <laughs> so it was, it was something that my, um, my, my classmates laughed at me for. They're like, why did you bring this all the way from the US? You could have just got a copy here. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Uh, quick question. Yeah, sure. What are the traditional ways of, like, for example, if one of your Hanafuda cards gets lost or you need to replace them? Like, how do people usually compromise their right? Um, It really depends. So if, if you're dealing with a deck like this that's um, really rare, I only bring this out and I keep my eye on it. If I lose a card, I'm kind of screwed, um, especially considering that different decks might have very different backs, just in the same way that Amer like Western style trump cards will as well. Um, as far as replacing things like uh, Mahjong, I know that you can buy individual tiles, but you have to make sure that they're the same size and back as the ones that you're replacing. For really expensive sets like that or Go, you can get replacement pieces. Um, most people who play Hanafuda nowadays aren't playing with an expensive set. They're playing with, I've even seen them as like actual cards. Um, the last time I, I brought, taught this panel, I'd actually just come back from Japan again. So I just had like stacks that I brought back, including like a little kid's Hello Kitty, like my first Hanafuda set. Um, that was cards. So I mean, if you lose those, oh no, you spent $5 on Hanafuda in the same way that you spent $5 on trump cards. Just get another deck. Yeah, but if you're if, like Nintendo um, for their expensive Go sets, for example, you can buy replacement pieces. Um, but then you're talking about in the same way that you're you've got like a thousand dollar chessboard, you're replacing that one piece. Um, this this would be something that's an heir, fa family heirloom, like say a crocodile board or a chess board or like a really really fancy checkers board. Anybody else? Thank you. If you got any questions for me personally, come find me. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your con. <laughs>